Yeah, he was like preached my entire sermon right then. I'm not sure I didn't even have anything to say now. That was that was really right on task. Right on task about everything I'm going to say. I have to say something this morning though, and probably most of you are feeling the same way I am today. I'm feeling a little blue. I'm feeling a little Duke blue this morning because Duke lost, and then I have to come in this morning and see so much Carolina blue, like like literally littering the the congregation here. Sam is wearing a very Carolina bluish vest. Very proud, proud like, but uh, I know most of us are Duke fans, so you're right here with me, right? Yeah, nobody? Okay, I'm still by myself. No, I'm still trying, still trying in that area. Well, go Carolina, I guess. I guess that's what I need to say now, just get over it, but there's always the big tournament. What am I talking about, Babylon? Well, good morning, welcome back. Are you guys awake this morning? You lost an hour of sleep last night. Are you here this morning? Are you awake? You're here. A couple of you are here, this side. I'm not convinced this side's here. Are you guys here? Yeah, I've got a couple of you here this morning. All right, I'm here this morning too. Praise God. We get to come here together and worship God in this setting, and that's a wonderful thing if we're, we're not focused on that, but I know we are. Well, we're finishing up our series now today on God's freedom. And, and I have to say, I have received a couple of emails and, and texts and just in general conversation for some of you. Some of you people who are wondering if I've been spying on you. If I have been spying on you, yeah. In general, the comments have been, you know, Pastor, when you started this series, I thought you were probably going to be talking about other people, not talking about me. You know, it seems as if you've been talking directly to me. And if you didn't know this, we actually, during the week, when you fill out those response cards, Sam gets the information and he follows you around in his little trike. He peeks at your windows. He sees what's going on in your mailbox. He, he, he knows who you are. You know, because Sam can sneak around like that. He's very stealth-like, right? That's, that's how we do that. And really, though, it ought not to surprise us when we're talking about God's freedom, really, that God would be speaking directly to us. Excuse me a second. That he'd be speaking directly to us because everybody in this room, everybody in this room struggles with something. If we're honest with ourselves, we all struggle with something. But the great news is that the steps to freedom are always the same. They're always the same. And that's great news, isn't it? Yeah. Now, when we started this series a few weeks ago, about a month ago, I talked about the first step, which is really a reality step that went something like this. I must admit that I am powerless to fix my own problems. Amen. Which seems profound because we really, when we, when we finally admit we can't fix ourselves, we start getting better. Don't we? We start getting better. And now last week I talked about the commitment step, which is I'm going to turn over the control of my life and my problems to someone who can help me. Who is Jesus, right? And that's when you, when you really begin to make a momentous turn towards freedom. Now, this week we have the third step. We have the third step of this, which I like to call the house cleaning step. And this is it. I must examine my life and confess my faults. I must examine my life and confess my faults. In other words, I get honest with God and I get honest with myself. And in moving forward with this step, I will admit that there are some things in my life in all of our lives here that need to change, that need to change, honestly. There are some things about me that really need to be addressed. Now, why is that so important? Why is that so, so super important? Well, it's because the guilt over my faults and my shortcomings keep me in bondage. I'm a prisoner to that. Guilt keeps us stuck in the past. Guilt keeps us from living a life of real Freedom, And so if you're ever going to find freedom in Jesus, you're going to have to find a way to let go of all your guilt. Amen? That makes sense? Now listen, everybody in here, everybody bar none, has regrets. Every one of us wishes we could go back and undo something that we've done. Something that we've said. If we could only go back and undo that thing that we did. If we could only take those stupid words that we said to that person and cram them right back in our mouth, that would be wonderful, right? Well, we wish we could. But we can't. We can't do that. We cannot go back and fix those things. And so we feel guilty. And we carry that around. And we wish that guilt, that stuff would go away. But it won't. 
Listen, the only way to deal with guilt is to find a way to get a clean conscience, to somehow purge your past. And so that's what I want to talk about this morning. Now, I think this third, this third step is based on several passages of Scripture, but we'll be looking at one of them as our text today, and that is Psalm 32. And this is beginning with verse 2, and this will be on the screen. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared, cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away, and I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Wow, man, I love that passage. Did you hear what God says there? He says, I want to take away your guilt. I want to take it away. I want to be able to give you the freedom that you are looking for. I want to forgive all of your sins. You see, the problem that God is referring to in this passage is that we keep trying to hold on to our guilt. And we try to keep it away from him. Yeah, if we would just fess up, if we would just open up our lives and let him have those things, he could forgive us. And we let him know about that, confess it, he would just wipe our slate clean. He could take away our guilt and help us. Amen. And you see, I don't think we understand. I don't think we fully grasp the, debil the debilitating nature of guilt. Guilt kills us. All of us. And sometimes we don't even realize that we're guilty. We don't even realize that we feel that way. But we are. You see, guilt does two things. First, it robs us of our confidence. It robs us of our confidence. We say, what if someone finds out who I am? What am I all about? If people only knew the truth about me, they would reject me. That sound familiar? Now, we all know that's not true, though, right? You know, by the way, you know, the people who have been standing up here giving their testimony during this series and share the most intimate part of their lives, they haven't been rejected, right? No, they have been celebrated by all of you after doing that. In fact, folks have, folks have made a beeline to them to congratulate them and to say, you know what? You were so co courageous in doing that. And I know everyone here, if you told them or not, have been thinking, you know what? You gave me courage. You gave me courage to do that, to purge some of my stuff, to take the next step in this journey. Listen, and I've said this many times, but listen, God already knows our deepest, darkest secrets. He already knows where we've been. He knows what we've done. He knows what we said. And he loves us. And he likes us. Anyway, you heard Tyler and Emily singing that. He loves us. Oh, how he loves us. And that is great news this morning. He knows who we are, really who we are, and he loves us anyway. And we can have great confidence in that this morning, okay? Now on the flip side of that, on the flip side, Satan also knows what we have done. Not because he's God, not because he's all-knowing, not, you know, but it's, it's really just because he's been watching us. He's watched us screw up over and over. And so Satan just wants to remind us constantly of our past. And he'll say, do you remember when you did this? Do you remember when you said that? Do you remember when you hurt that person? Right? Does that sound familiar? And you know, when we listen to those things that are bouncing around in our heads, that just robs us of our confidence. It robs us of who we really are. But God wants to put that confidence back in you. He wants to put it back in me. And you know, the second thing that, that, that guilt does is this. It keeps us stuck in the past. Guilt keeps us stuck in the past, yeah. You know, when you're driving, there, there's a great tool right there located on your windshield. It's called uh, the rearview mirror. You know what I'm talking about? And, and it's, it's something that you ought to refer to occasionally just to see what's behind you. It will give you great perspective as you're driving. But if you drive and you only look at your rearview mirror, what happens? You crash, right? You will crash ultimately. You cannot drive 
looking behind you. And honestly, a lot of people try living their lives that way. They just get caught up in the past. They live in the past. They can't take their eyes off of it. But when you do that, you cannot move forward. You cannot move forward. You can't live with freedom, with the freedom that God wants to give you. Okay? So here's the spiritual principle for today. This will be on the screen. Guilt cannot change the past any more than worry can change the future. Guilt cannot change the past any more than worry can change the future. You see, feeling guilty is not going to change the past. I have got to find a way to get my, get my past, get rid of get, get my, the guilt out of my past, get rid of that, purge that, get rid of my guilt. So I guess the million dollar question this morning is this. How do you do that? How do you do that? How do you take a step to be able to examine your life and then confess your faults? That's the million dollar question. Well, there are five parts, I think, to taking this step, and that's what I want to work through with everyone this morning. And the first one is this. The first step is this. I take a moral inventory of my life. I take a moral inventory of my life, a personal moral inventory, okay? Which means I ask myself, what is wrong with me? What is wrong with me? Where are the areas that I have faults and the areas that I have pain? And probably the best thing to ask ourselves is this. Where do I feel the most guilty? Where do I need the most help? And then I make a list. And then I make a list. And, and then some of you in here, anyone in here list makers? You like to make lists? Anyone? A lot of you. A lot of you like to make lists, yeah. And, and I, I, know, I know how you feel. My wife and I are the same way. We make so many lists that we have to make a list to know where the other lists are. Yeah, like a directional list to find out where the other lists, the things that we, we make are. And so we actually absolutely understand what you're going through there. So if you're like Saber and I, you know, this is right up your alley. Absolutely up your alley. You make a list. You simply make a list and you write down um, those things in your life that you feel guilty about. Some of the faults there, okay? Now, this is what Psalm 139, 23, 23 and 24 say. And this will be on the screen. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you. And lead me along the path of everlasting life. Wow. So you just say, Lord, I'm sitting here. I've got my pencil. I've got my paper. Bring it to my mind. Point out the places that I have failed. Lord, here are my shortcomings. Here are the places in my life that I do not have the power to fix. Lord, help me recognize these areas in my life where I am weak so that I can write them down now so that you may begin a work in me, a great work in me. Lord, I have tried and I can't do it. And you know, I think the key to making a list, making this kind of list, is ruthless honesty. Ruthless honesty. What needs to change? I mean, if you're going to change who you were, change something in you, why would you write down? Why would it be? So you make a list. And by the way, just so you know this, this list is not for your refrigerator. It's not something you hang on your refrigerator, because you may make the mistake of making it your grocery list. And that person, that food lion, the clerk there in the line may know a little more about you than what you want them to know. So do not put this on your refrigerator. No, you put it in your Bible. You keep it somewhere safe and private. This list is for you, and this list is for God, okay? Now, why should you? Why should you write this down? Well, because if you don't write it down, we don't get very specific, do we? If we don't do that, we don't get very, we get very vague. We say, Lord, will you help me with my problems? Help me with my problems. Instead of, Lord, here's what I've tried my best to fix in me. And I cannot. I want to turn it over to you. And you know, a wise sage once said this. Faults disentangle themselves when they pass from the lips to the fingertips. From the lips to the fingertips. So I'll write it down. Okay? And listen, this is something that I have done a bunch of times, and maybe some of you have done this too. Whether you've written it in your journal, if you've written it in your Bible, you've written it on paper, just written it anywhere, you make a list and then you present it to God. Lord, here are the places that I have tried, and here are my faults, and this is where I failed. Okay? All right, the second step is this. I take responsibility for my faults. 
I take responsibility for my faults. I make a list, and then I take responsibility for the things that are on my list. Proverbs 20, 27 says this. The Lord's light penetrates the human spirit, exposing every hidden motive. You see, God's flashlight is pretty powerful. God searches us. He sees us. He knows us. You know, I don't have to hide my faults, my sins from God. He already knows what they are. You know, and, and the truth most of the time is that we try to do any and everything that we can to not accept personal responsibility for what we've done, if we're honest. That's what we do, right? Most people say, you know, this relationship I'm in, it's a train wreck. It's terrible. I think I'll go out and get another one. It'll make me feel better about myself. Yeah, that's what I'll do. Or maybe I won't get out of this relationship. I will start another one on the side, and that'll make me feel better if I do that. Yeah, if I do those things, then, you know, that's the way it'll be. That's what, that'll, that'll be a good thing for my life. It'll make me feel so much better. Or... I'll change jobs. That's what my problem is. It's my boss's fault. Or I'm going to leave town and start new. Right? That will cure everything. I'll just run. I'll run away from it. But do you know what the problem is with that technique? Any idea what the problem is with that technique? Well, the problem with that approach, the approach where, you know, I, I run or I blame and stuff like that, the problem with that approach is wherever I go. There I am. Wherever I go, there I am. I'm the problem. I'm the problem. You're the problem. The reason the relationships keep messing up a lot of times is me. It's me. I'm the one. Yeah, I'm the one who takes my mess with me. I'm the one who keeps messing up my life a lot of the times. I've got to fess up to that. It's me. It's me that has a problem. Right? I make a list, and then I take a responsibility for that. And you know, when Saber and I first started dating, we, we, we played a little game as we were getting to know each other in that familiar part of the dating relationship. And we would sit around a lot of times, and uh, we'd say, well, you tell me one secret about you, and I'll tell you one secret about me. <clears throat> and I noticed as we were playing this game, first of all, I was a little embarrassed. That a, lot, a lot of you know my testimony. And I was a little embarrassed to tell her some personal things about me. Um, but when I did... I found myself still kind of being on the, you know, on the side of it wasn't all my fault, which it wasn't all my fault, but not taking responsibility for my end. So when I said it, I was like, well, this person I was with, they weren't very nice. They weren't a good person. So when that relationship came, it crashed and burned, it had to be all their fault, right? It wasn't me because obviously you can see, Saber, that I'm perfect. And everything about me is wonderful, right? You know, my breath smells like carnation milk. You know how sweet I am and how these things would never come from me, right? Yeah, I'm not sure about the sweet breath, but I made it sound that way. And I, as I was verbalizing this, as this was articulated, I was thinking, you know what? I still haven't owned up to all my side of this. I still haven't owned up to that. And I recognize that immediately. And for a long time, you know, I like a lot of us here, with our mistakes, I blamed everyone else. Anybody else ever do that? No one else, I'm the only one that has problems. Thank you for being honest. Thank you. You know, it's gonna get harder as the sermon goes, so you guys prepare yourself. I think we have seat belts on these seats. You, got, you might wanna strap them on right now, okay? Strap them on. At the end of the sermon, it's gonna be something very, very difficult, but refreshing. But yet for a long time, I blamed everybody else. It's her fault. She did me wrong. How dare she? I deserve this other drink. I need to drink a little bit more to make me feel good inside. Another substance that I need to take to make me feel good because they did me wrong. And I'm so perfect. Right? I did not have that one a coming. Have we ever said that? I didn't have that one coming. I didn't deserve that. Well, maybe not. Maybe you didn't deserve that. Maybe I didn't deserve that. But I had to realize that the only common denominator in all the bad experiences I've ever had was me. Was me. Wherever I go, there I am. Okay? Amen? And you know, it's easy to rationalize, especially for dudes. We rationalize. We just, justify things. We say, I know a lot of people who struggle like I do. A lot of people are doing this. 
And, and you know what? Yeah, you're right. They do. You know, I know a lot of people too. And they are just as sick as you are. Just as sick as I am. We just have to own up <laughs> to our truth. Are you guys here this morning? Yes, sir. Because really, if we're honest, the blame game has never helped anyone. Amy, has the blame game ever helped anyone in your what you do confession? Amy's a psychiatrist. Never. The blame game will never help anything except for fixing the, the fact that you're blaming someone else. I guess it does fix that. It shows, it identifies that you are blaming other people. It has not or will not unwrite the hurts of the other people in your life. Nor has it unwritten the hurts in your own life. Never. We just have to fess up to what we are. You know, also, it's easy to minimize our problems. We say, you know what? It's not that big a deal. Remember the lump in my neck thing, the story I was talking about? It's not that big a deal. You can barely see the big old lump in the side of my neck. It looks like a camel hump. Stick it over here. You can't see that. It's not that big a deal. Well, honestly, if it were not that big a deal, you probably wouldn't be feeling guilty about it, would you? If you're honest, it is a big deal. It is a huge deal. And you continue to feel guilty about it. I continue to feel guilty about it. And that guilt weighs you down and makes you a prisoner. And you know, it's easy to point at other people and say, you know what, if they acted better, I would too. It's their fault. I was with them. I was, being, I was behaving myself. I was being a good boy. They started acting up and I wanted to be part of the crowd. So I did it too. But at least I knew it was wrong. I don't think they knew it was wrong. I did it, but I knew it was wrong. If you're thinking this, if you're thinking that, if, if they acted better, you would too? Probably not. Probably not, okay? The point is, you should change who you can change. You can't change them. You can't change them. You can only get help for you. Only for you. We need to take a personal responsibility, take a personal inventory of our lives, and then take personal responsibility for this list that we make. All right, 1 John 1.8 says this. If we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. You see, the problem is me. It's me. That's what we're saying, all right? Okay. Now, the third part of taking this step is this. I ask God for forgiveness. I ask God for forgiveness. 1 John 1.9 says this. And, and this, this verse is pretty powerful. I mean, I, I think this is one that's worthy of your memory. Putting this in your memory. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and, and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all our, our wickedness. Wow. Now, asking God's forgiveness <coughs> is so important that I just want to have an honest word with you this morning, okay? For some of you, this may be life-changing. You see, I don't need to beg God to forgive me because he already wants to forgive me. Did you hear what I just said? He already wants to forgive me. I don't have to beg him to do something that he already wants to do. He wants to forgive me. He loves me. He wants to heal me. He wants to bring freedom to me. I don't have to bargain with God. I don't have to do that, okay? Please let that sink in. I don't think we get that sometimes. All right, there's a fourth part of this step today uh, to examining my life and confess my faults. It's this, and this is a hard one. I have to admit my faults to another person. I have to admit my faults to another person. Now you're probably saying, did Eric just say what I think he said? Well, if you thought I said admit my thought, my faults to another person, then yes. Yes, I said what you just thought I said, right? You know, did you know that God tells us that it is absolutely essential for us to admit our faults to him and, and to another person also? If we really want to receive his healing and his recovery, that's what we have to do. Let's look at what it says in James 5, 16. <coughs> Excuse me one second. James 5, 16 says this. Confess your sins to each other. And pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. So why do I need to make a list of my faults and then tell another person about it and then kind of drag them into my mess too? Why can't I just tell God? Just let God know, confess my sins and move on. Well, I think there's two reasons for this. 
I believe. The first is this. You have probably already tried that and it didn't work. Am I right? You probably have already tried that first one and it didn't work for you. And the second reason is this. The second reason is that we wear masks, don't we? We wear masks in front of God, in front of each other, and in front of ourselves. And why do we wear masks? Well, primarily because we think, who would want to be with damaged goods? Who would want to be around that? If they know what I've done, where I've been, they will reject me. So we tell ourselves to only disclose a little bit of our faults, right? Because we are convinced that we are damaged goods. That's what we tell ourselves, right? So we hold on to our secrets. We hold on to them so tight until they make us sick. Physically sick. Now someone said this one time, and I think it's brilliant. I am only as sick as my secrets. I am only as sick as what I'm holding inside. And I think there's a lot of truth to that statement. Now what I've learned over the course of time is that if I hide something, if I had a pro hide a problem that I have, if I push it away in the dark, it actually gains power. It gains momentum and it grows bigger. But if I pull it into the light, into truth, and share it, and confess it to God, and with someone else, it actually loses its power. It loses steam. And I begin to find freedom in that, in the breaking of those chains. Amen? And you know, sometimes in life, when something tragic and unexpected happens, when it occurs, we find that we either become bitter, or we run away from God, or we embrace our situation and ask God to bless it. And those around us during the process, you know, let thy will be done. It's up to us ultimately to decide which path we take. And I think many of us realize that if we run from God with whatever problems we may be facing, whether it's from our own doing or some unfortunate circumstance, we will never, never find freedom if we do that. You see, if we run, it is in that the problem actually owns us. We are owned by that problem. When we run, it is in that we become a prisoner in a cell of our own making. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, over the last couple of weeks, we've, uh, we've heard some from, from some real people in the church, heard some real stories, you know, not hired actors. These are real people right here and, and who have survived life's hard knocks. And love to tell about it. And they've chosen to give their lives and their problems to God through this. And as a result, they and we have been blessed by their faithfulness and their testimonies. And, and it makes us realize that we are not alone. That other people share in some things that we've been to. Uh, through all the struggles in life, you know, we have that common bond. And today is, uh, and I've kind of put them on the spot, but uh, today is no different. I'm, called Big Sam up here with his Carolina blue vest. Um, I thought you would have changed it by now, but that's okay. That's okay. Come on up. And uh, Sam, it's a privilege to hear your story this morning, and I'm going to give the mic over to you. All right. I'm going to finish up his uh, sermon real quick. Right here. Well, there's one more step in the third step of freedom. I'm sorry. My name's Sam Lewis, and I'm I have the privilege to um, be a part of, of the church. Um, and I think uh, when, when many of us think about church, we think about a building, we think about a building with a cross on it, and it has nice seats and you know nice air conditioning and it smells good. And I think uh, in my testimony growing up, um, I was raised in a church family and I was very fortunate. In my early beginnings, I was taught <clears throat> in what I call a God concept, a perception of what God is and what the church is. And the church is not a building at all. It's the, it's, it's the outpouring from us. And uh, I know that um, I bring a lot of sin and baggage in my life and a lot of insecurities, personal insecurities. You know, I take all the little big jokes and the ball jokes and the Carolina jokes and, you know, but deep, 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 deep down in me, there's the insecurity. There's a little boy that was picked on by kids. And they stole my joy. 
It made me feel less than human. And I'm not sure where any of you guys are in your lives, but there are things that I held on to and for years. <clears throat> and then I went to college. <laughs> and I found some things in college that um, made me feel good for a time. And uh, made me feel some joy that uh, wasn't of God. And um, I think some of you guys can probably fill in the blanks on some of those things. And um, thank goodness uh, I was raised in the God concept from birth because uh, his penetrating light as a pastor was talking about shone on me when I got to that point of destitution when I was just at my end of my rope um, when I started to <clears throat> get into my career, into my marriage and to my professional life because that little boy would start to creep out and uh, would not want to uh, take uh, those uh, opportunities God, God would give us to, to do ministry. Um, you know, I think uh, Eric and some other friends, they call those Kairos moments. Uh, if you ever seen like, uh, have you guys seen Star Trek? See Star Trek, you know, the, the little orb, the old Star Trek, you know, they, 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 they go into the orb and they go, Whoa. and they go into the, back to the ship, right? <sighs> and they materialize. Well, God does that to us a lot of times and uh, Sam, you should work with youth. Sam, you should do music. And I say, I couldn't get up there. Nobody wants to see a big old slob like me up, up front and, you know, worshiping God. They want to see somebody that's fit and trim and beautiful. And, and they don't want to see me because of my, you know, those my insecurities. And I got to a point in my life, I, I looked at those things and I said, well, you know what? I'm, I'm married now. Lost all my hair. Um, but I still got all these talents. I think I can sing pretty good and play the guitar. And, and people would confirm that, Eric. <laughs> and other people in my lives would confirm that. I would start believing it. And you just ask, and God will just keep shining that light. And he put me, like, out of my comfort zone. And if I would have been probably <clears throat> 10 years ago up here, and I shared this, I think, with Emily the other day, I said, I couldn't be up there doing I, I wouldn't have been up here doing what you're doing now, you know, 10 years ago. I was petrified, you know, because that little voice in my head, Satan. Getting a foothold. You guys ever climb up a ladder? Um, uh, the way I look at Satan now is, is a whole different thing. I'm not afraid of him um, because I know he's always creeping around. You know, they say Satan's just running around like a raging tiger and he's ready to rip and tear. But how many of you guys have ever seen a, a, a cat or a, or a lion in the wild? You ever been on a safari? I had a friend on a safari recently. And when you go on a safari, you see the giraffes and all the hippos and the all the stuff that you see out there, the wilderness and antelopes hopping around. But you don't ever see the, the lions and tigers. You know why? Because they're creeping. They're down in the grass. They're trying to steal and kill and take your joy. So um, when the pastor was preaching earlier, I said, um, you know, my thing is I'm not going to give the devil a foothold on me and let him climb up me and steal my joy. Because I know there's a greater thing waiting I'm not sure if I'm running over time, but, uh, you know, I wrote a few things down. I went to a concert, awesome concert Friday night. Um, it just currently, um, I saw a t-shirt that said, big t-shirt said, I'm second. Because God's what? Okay. And um, I know I fall short every day. I say things that I'm ashamed of. Um, I think things that I'm just petrified. If anybody knew, I'd be, oh my gosh. But thank goodness I got friends like Eric. I can turn to him and call Sonny. <laughs> and we can talk during the week. And we can confess each other's shortcomings. Sorry about staying losing yesterday. But uh, sorry about Duke. But you know, God is good. Uh, was a song we used to sing where you can't get to heaven in a red canoe. Because Jesus' favorite color is. Carolina blue. There you go. That was my daughter, by the way. We sing that sometimes. So. Uh, and I want to close with this. I know a pastor said about John 1, 9. 
And we heard this the other night at the concert from the, uh, the speaker that came. He said, if you confess, he'll cleanse you. And, uh, you know, there was a song that just rings true in my, in my heart from a, from a child in that you don't have to, like, preach and teach and, 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 and be, like, learned in the Bible and, and be some kind of big theologian or have a, a, a degree in apologetics or whatever it is, you know, or what's that thing, post-millennialism and pre, pre and post and um, X, Y, Z and equals pi. Okay, I don't, I don't know all that stuff. I just know that if you want people to believe in God, you just let them know through your testimony of how you live your life out. And they'll know, and this is the song, they'll know that you're Christians by your love, about how you really live out, outwardly, your love. Not, you know, through gossip and through, you know, oh my gosh, I think she's not wearing that outfit. Or, you know, those types of things. Or, you know, saying what you're thinking all the time, just outwardly pouring out love. And people will be drawn to that light. Like a moth to a flame. I don't know, I know Pastor put me on the spot today, and I'm going to share my heart, but, you know, I do this because I love God, and no other reason, not for anybody here, because God is first, right, and I'm second, and uh, that's just kind of my testimony, thank you. Thank you, Sam. And that, that takes a lot of uh, a lot of strength to come up here, a lot of trust. I think I think what Sam offers and and what he what he's saying there, uh, a lot of us go through in some capacity in our lives. But what he offers there is honesty and knowing who he is. He has definition of the Lord that he is fearfully and wonderfully made, and I think that is a wonderful a wonderful place for us all to be there. It absolutely is. Okay, there's one more step in this third step of freedom, and we're, we're winding up here, winding down. So in review, I want to say what we've, what we've gone over already. I make a list. I ask God for forgiveness. I find someone I trust, and then I share it with them or write it down. Uh, I, I tell them, disclose it with them, and then we walk through it together. And lastly, lastly, I accept God's forgiveness. I accept God's forgiveness. You see, the unfortunate truth is this, that so many people ask for his forgiveness, but they won't receive it. They never receive it. They never accept his forgiveness. And this is unfortunate because God's forgiveness is wonderful. It's instant. It's free. It's not like we deserve it, but he gives it to us anyway. And it is complete. It's complete forgiveness. And it is a beautiful thing. Now, I'm sure some of you are thinking this this morning. Eric, you know, have you been talking to my spouse about me or my significant other? I, I, you know, you, are you spying on me? How, how, do they, how do you know these things about me? You know, I know you must be looking at my mail or something. Well, to be honest, I don't. I don't know these things about this. I'm talking about us. I'm talking about all of us, all right? These are our steps that we go through. Everybody here including this guy with the fresh breath. Everybody here has fallen short of where God wants them to be. Every one of us have. And so God, he goes the rest of the way for us. He does the rest of the work for us and offers us forgiveness and freedom if only we will accept it, okay? All right, now this is the painful part I warned you about, right? But I, just trust me in this. This is so liberating because a lot of you, and again, I haven't been spying on you, but a lot of you, have been struggling with guilt. A lot of you have been struggling with something in your past, something that you've hidden, something that you haven't disclosed. So right now, on your seats, there should be a blank index card. Those little cool little clipboards that we just put out there now, there should be a blank index card. If you'll just find that, put that in your fingers. No, that would be, that'd be cool. If you notice all those blank index cards, there's no indicator for you to put your name on this. Please do not put your name on this. I do not want your name on this, all right? What I do want on this is some honesty. Whatever it is that you're struggling with, whatever it is, whatever guilt you have from the past, I don't care what age it is, something that you're still carrying around with you right now, and I know we all have this. If we're honest, and I want you to be honest this morning, whatever it is that you're struggling with, 
want you to write on that card. It can be one word, it can be a sentence, it can be a paragraph, whatever you want to do. I want you to write it on that card this morning. Something that you want to give to God and let God work in you now. And get rid of this. You're smudging the record. You're letting God forgive you of this. You're moving on to freedom. If you'll write that on that card there, fold it over. After you've written it down, fold it. And after you do that, the praise man's going to come back up here and play a song. And it's sort of like a ceremony here. We're going to drop these cards in this little basket up here. We're getting rid of this today. The day it stops. We're going to put it inside this basket. It's going to start row by row when the praise man comes up and starts playing. And what am I going to do with this? You know, am I going to have fun with this? Am I going to put this in the paper in Uber? Is it going to be disclosed to everyone? Well, first of all, it doesn't have your name in it. It doesn't have your name on that card. I don't know who wrote it. I don't care who wrote it. What I'm going to do with this is we're going to take it, put it in a pile, and we're going to burn it. We're going to burn it is what we're going to do. But first of all, I'm going to say a prayer over this. After everyone has put their piece of paper in this box, we're going to say a prayer, and we're going to let God be God of our lives. We're going to get rid of this one thing, two things, whatever it is that you've got this morning. This is your opportunity to admit it. To put it in this box and get rid of it okay all right so as the as the praise band plays this morning they're coming forward here we're going to start on the left hand side similar to the way, the way we take communion and just come up here and drop drop your paper in the basket okay and i hope you all do this obviously you know this is up to you this is between you and god whether or not you participate in this or not but i can assure you i've done this before i've done this a couple times before it works. Give it to God this morning as a great man place. this first step here has, has you know, just the fact that you were able to write it down and get rid of it. I hope the healing has already begun. But I know as you're working through this, whatever it was, whatever you placed an offering, an offering to God, whatever that is this morning, I know God's working on it. God's helping with you already. And right now we're going to proclaim and we're going to ask forgiveness and we're going to give this to God um, and let it heal you. But the key is this, you need to accept it. You need to accept the fact that He wants to heal you. That He wants to be a part of your life. That He knows who you are. He knows where you've been. He knows everything you've done. He knows everything you've said. He knows who you are. And He loves you in spite of that. He loves me in spite of that. And I tell you what, I have a laundry list of things that I can be regretful about. And I've had much regret in my life. I've never been so liberated as when I've given myself completely to God. I can assure you of that, of nothing else. Of nothing else, I can assure you of that. So now we're going to say a prayer. 
We're going to say a prayer over this box. And we're going to get rid of these things this morning. Not so I hope you're honest with this and saying, God, I truly give this to you. I not only just write it on a piece of paper, but I mean it. I want to get rid of it. I don't want this anymore in my life. And God will start the healing process like that, I can assure you. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we come this morning, we're, we're just totally, ruthlessly honest with you today about our shortcomings. Lord, this is one thing or multiple things that we're struggling with. Lord, I pray you just take them away. Expunge that from our record. Help us move on in a positive way towards freedom this morning. Because Lord, you want to heal us. You want to forgive us. But sometimes we feel so guilty, so overwhelmed by the fact that this one thing, or these multiple things are attached to us. They somehow define us. They somehow, they keep us imprisoned. And we stay behind those bars of our own making because we're, we feel so guilty. But Lord, just admitting it, admitting it to you and asking forgiveness, admitting it to someone else, someone that we trust like Sam was talking about, it is so liberating. And those are the steps we take to freedom. So Lord, please take all these things away from this, this church today. I pray you take them all and the, take them all at the healing begin because we know you are a healing God. You're a God full of grace. You're God who wants to help us with these steps, Lord. And I, and I pray as the series comes to an end that these words, these steps to freedom, they resonate in our lives from this point on. That we understand that you are God and we are not. That with you in our lives, we can live a true life, live a free life. Life has definition because you are a mighty God, a mighty God, Lord. So we ask all these things in your mighty name this morning. Amen. We have the guitar turned back up a little bit. It's really low. Are we ready to end this service, Pastor? All right. Let's stand as we as we uh, leave, and I think I think the service is over. So you guys have a great week. We're going to end with this song. Courageous, have an awesome week, and just uh, let God's light shine through you. We will make them be courageous. Have a great week. We will make them lead the way. With our liberation, finally break the chains. We will make them be courageous.